Crossway, welcome to church online. It's great to have our online congregation joining us this morning and also people coming in for our Burwood East service as we do our third service for the weekend. Great to have you today. Uh, my name is Bill Malcolm. I'm one of the team here at Crossway. This is my good friend, Wiss Shear. Wiss also works with the Life Group Department along with me. Uh, so it's great to be able to be here today, Wiss, and just sharing a little bit before the service of some of what we do as, uh, as pastors at Crossway and some of the things that are happening. But also it helps us to just be able to share a little bit online. If you're online today, uh, we want to especially welcome you. And we're having communion later in the service. So you've got 15 minutes before we start worship to go and get some elements that you can share uh, some bread, some juice. Uh, we'd love for you to be a part of our communion time together. Um, so you got, while you're getting your tea and coffee, uh, maybe grab some bread and some juice as well. Uh, Scott will be sharing that in his message. Scott Pilgrim's preaching today, always wonderful to have Scott preach. He always challenges us in uh, areas that we uh, don't always look naturally into, I find, with Scott, but he's a wonderful one for challenging us to step outside our comfort zone. So Scott sharing today, it's the second part of our Abide In Me series. Uh, Heather Packett kicked off the series last Sunday. Fantastic message. If you didn't hear the message from Heather last week, can I recommend you jump on Crossway Online or on Facebook Live and uh, have a look at the message from Heather. It was one of the best messages I've ever heard uh, on a passage that's probably familiar to us all, uh, but very much uh, gave a new slant on it for us to really see what God's doing. And so the Abide In Me series is leading into Easter. And of course, Easter's coming. Easter's only two weeks away. Yes, yes. Can you yes. believe that? So one of those great things. Uh, here at Crossway, we actually have uh, an Easter presentation that we do each year. And we're going to do that again this year. Uh, the beauty this year, we can actually be in person. Uh, we'll be on, online as well, but it will be in person for those who uh, get tickets. We'll be limited seating like it is for our Sunday services. So if you're thinking of coming along to our uh, Easter presentation, who is it that you can invite? Who's the friend that you have who may well benefit from hearing that Easter presentation? So that's uh, the tickets will be free this year, uh, but you'll need to book online line when they become available. So the, the, the Easter presentation will be on Good Friday. Uh, it starts Thursday night, actually, Easter Thursday, 7.30. And then Good Friday, we've got two services, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. And then the Saturday, a normal five o'clock service. And Easter Sunday, we've actually got baptism services. So it's always fun to see uh, people being baptised on Easter Sunday. Great time to see it, uh, see it happen. But one of the great things at Crossway is uh, Crossway's a big church. And there's look, we always look for opportunities to join in community. One of the ways that Wiss and I regularly see that happen uh, is our role as life group pastors uh, is connecting people into life groups. So Wiss, tell us a little bit. You've been a life group pastor at Crossway now for three or four years, I think. Um, what is it for you that life groups provide in, in, order, in terms of uh, providing community for people who might be new to Crossway and they've come along and they're wanting to join in? What does life groups offer in that way? How does life groups help? Right. Um, I was uh, one of the persons who uh, got a lot of benefits from joining a life group when I first came to Crossway. Um, and in Crossway Life Group, we uh, always want to connect people to a community where they can find uh, support and also to be able to live a life like uh, what uh, Jesus told us. Well, I believe that since the first century, uh, God used groups and now life groups to bless a lot of people. Yeah. So we still do that because we believe that this is the best way uh, for people to communicate and also to connect to a, a wider community uh, in church and also to be able to support one another in the journey. Yeah. And look, you know, people who may have been around church for a while may be familiar with you know, a study Bible study group or a home group or a cell group, all the different names. We call ours life groups because we believe that's the place where you can do life together. And for our life groups, we have a little bit of a, a, a three-point philosophy that we use. Do you yes. want to share a little bit about that? With the up in and out, how, how does that work? What does that yes. look like? Yeah, it is actually as simple as that. That's what, what Bill just said. It is like a triangle. So it is the, the upper point is the up, is our relationship with God. So in a life group, we encourage people to learn more about God and at the same time to build that intimate relationship with God. And uh, the other point is the in. So using Life Group as a platform, we learn how to love one another and also to demonstrate how Jesus loved to us and so that we can bless more people. So, so the third 
point uh, is the outreach, so which is the outreach. So using Live as a platform, what we learn how to use um, this platform to outreach to people, to serve the community, yeah. and sometimes to even read the Bible with other people to help them to uh, know Jesus more. And that's certainly been a bit of a transformation for Crossway over the last, probably the last seven years. I've been here seven years, eight years now, as a life group pastor. My role has pretty much been life group pastor along with some other roles in that time. But I think for me, seeing the transformation from it being a Bible study group uh, to being a life group, I think that change has been around the fact that it was traditionally perhaps the groups were more about doing a Bible study and looking after each other, mm -hmm. whereas now the aim is more about disciples that multiply. And that's Crossway's philosophy right across. It's our, our mission statement. Um, so we want to see that in every area of church life. And so certainly our life groups are a place that we can see the up and out, the, the God, the community and the, the um, mission. And so very much we want to see our groups to be more missional, but they're that's looking right. to yeah, be disciples that multiply. That's a key thing to what we do. If you're just joining us, uh, we're going to be starting our service in about 10 minutes. So if you're joining us online, a special welcome to you. It's great to have our online congregation as part of what we do on a Sunday. Not everyone's able to fit in the building just yet. Uh, it's great that we can gather. It's so exciting. I, I'm excited just getting back with people. Yes. It's one of the challenges I found last year with 2020 was doing all that we do online for everything. Um, we found it quite tiring at times. But I've been, even this morning, just walking around the foyer and having an opportunity to chat with people that... I haven't seen for a long time. I just caught yeah. up with a dear lady. She's, I think she's about 88. Uh, and she is a long-time family friend who has been coming along here with her, her uh, daughter and son-in-law. And it was wonderful. To, I hadn't seen her for 12 months because she hadn't been. And wow. she was saying how much she missed community. So it's a wonderful thing that we can actually join in community and encourage each other and uh, be here in person. But also for those online, many of us online aren't able to be here physically. Uh, we have people online from all around Melbourne, all around Australia, all across the world. We have people tapping in from uh, other countries. Uh, it's a wonderful way for our international workers to connect as well, is our church online. So it's very exciting. to. So I think we have about 80 international workers. So it's exciting that it gives them an opportunity to be a part of Crossway. So welcome uh, to our online audience. We're seeing our Burwood East congregation for our second service this morning, just coming into the auditorium now. So as you come in, it's wonderful. Uh, we are having communion today, so just prepare yourself if you're online. Uh, that's something you will need to prepare yourself for. One of the things we, uh, we do as a church at the start of each year is prayer and fasting. Mm. And it's been exciting just to see, uh, we do 10 days of prayer and fasting and as a church we, we participate in that uh, as a body. And it's been exciting just to see what God's doing through that time. Uh, our our bigger picture vision for 2021 is see I make all things new, coming from uh, Revelations 22 verse 5. And it's amazing how through our time of prayer and fasting, speaking with uh, Pastor Scott Mitchell, who heads up our prayer teams, speaking with some of the intercessors, very much the theme that came through from that uh, time of prayer and fasting was the idea that God has more for us yes. and very much that God wants to do more and, and see more happening uh, and, and that he has a bigger plan. And that's one of the wonderful things that, uh, that we can look forward to for this year. So for WIS, for you, uh, we'll step back to life groups for a moment. Um, your life group that you personally are a part of, uh, I'm aware that you know, you've now taken a different role. You're now leading a group with some younger married couples. Yes. Uh, now, tell us a little bit about what that is and why, why have you stepped into that demographic? <laughs> All right. Uh, me and my husband, we are um, in transition to become empty nester. And that's why we feel younger. So we decided that um, uh, we want to be involved in um, a younger couples group. So where we are able to also uh, journey with these younger couples with their marriage, in their relationship. And uh, most important of all, uh, we feel like God has blessed us so much and we just want to bring back um, the, all these blessings to other people. So uh, besides helping other people to find a community, to find a life group they can feel belong to, uh, one of our roles is to empower people to use their gifts uh, in the life group and through life group so that they can bring more glory to God. Yeah. That's wonderful. And if someone wants to join a life group, what's the process for people online or people in the congregation? How's, what's the best way to join a life group at this time? Right. If you are in the campus, 
uh, you can always go to the Next Steps Lounge after the service and uh, to chat with us more about Life Group. And if you are online, it is very easy. Just go to uh, www.crossway.org.au and where you can find steps, how you will be able to um, sign up for Life Group. So in the Life Group, uh, page, you can see some of these groups, they are still open to um, have new people. So you see whether um, this group is in, um, it suits your demographic, your geographic, and so um, start from there, fill in the form, submit to us, and then the live group leaders will be able to contact you in time. Awesome. That's great, Wes. Thank you for that. We're just leading into a time, we're about to move into a time of worship. Um, Pastor Scott sharing this morning on the Abide in Me series, a week two of that, very much pushing into the zone of you know, how do we serve and, and looking at Jesus as the example of how we serve. And it's one of the wonderful areas that uh, Crossway has opportunity for everyone to serve. Uh, it's one of the things that if you're part of Crossway, then there's opportunity to serve somewhere. I know our production team are looking for production artists who can be a part of that team to help with some of the behind the scenes stuff, some of the creative stuff. Um, so yeah, certainly if that's an area that uh, God's challenging you to be involved, there's plenty of opportunities to be involved in that. Yes. Uh, along with other things, there's always things that we can be doing uh, to serve God. And certainly one of the wonderful things that came out of 2020 was for people to look beyond their own realm of life and you know, look to their immediate neighbourhood. Who are the people in my street? Um, and looking at the idea of, is there someone that I can share the Bible with? Mm -hmm. uh, that's been a, a real area that we've seen grow at Crossway and we've seen a real step of multiplication through that. Yes. I know you, had, our team all stepped into that zone as a bit of a step out of our comfort zone. Please tell us a little bit about your experience in that asking someone to read the Bible with them. Is that something that you and your husband have been a part of, I'm aware? Yes, yes. This is always um, our heart to be able to read the Bible with other people. Because um, outreaching to other people's, you know, we, we have a lot of platforms. So reading Bible is definitely one of those very effective ways. Um, like last year during COVID, we are not able to uh, meet face to face. But it is wonderful to see how God used a different platform to reach out to His people. So last year, we were able to uh, invite people to read the Bible with us through like WhatsApp messaging and also via Zoom. Yeah. And at the end, it is amazing that people are changed by the Word of God. Yeah. And uh, so uh, this lady decided to follow Jesus. Yep. And then uh, at the end of the year, uh, um, in Christmas Day, actually, this guy that Eden uh, studied the Bible with um, got baptized via Zoom. Awesome. So that's really, really exciting. Yeah. So I just want you to know that God can use uh, any one of us and any platform to um, help His people. That's fantastic. Thank you, Wes, for sharing that. That. God is at work. We're just about to lead into our worship time. So um, I'm just going to pray and we can lead into worship. Jesus, we just want to thank you that we can gather here uh, in your name, uh, that we can gather as your people. And Lord, we want to pray that in all that we do, may you be glorified. As we worship you today, in, in uh, both online and in person, may we know the reality of your presence. And Lord, we just want to pray for hearing the word that you speak to us today, that it might be something beyond just hearing the word, but we can actually apply what we hear. So we thank you, Jesus, that this is an opportunity for us. And Lord, that you will continue to grow us and show us all that you're doing in this space. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, it's great to be a part of Crossway today, guys. And as we are uh, about to lead into worship, just remember communion today. If you're online, you've got 20 seconds to uh, go and grab yourself the elements that you might need. And beyond that, then we'll certainly uh, look to see where we go from there. Uh, but yeah, thank you for joining with us this morning and we look forward to your worship time.
Let us sing and worship and praise our God this morning.
out this morning. worship you this morning. We thank you that we're there two or three gather in your name, Jesus, that you are here with us. Lord, have your way this morning. Move in the midst of us and work in the midst of us, God, as we worship you this morning. You are here, moving in now.
see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, let's declare that you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. Thank you, God, that we can worship you. A way maker, promise keeper. We praise you for your faithfulness in our lives, Jesus. Yes. And we want to receive from you this morning as we worship you. Once you stretch out your arms, church, let me sing over you. Receive the blessing that is only from God this morning. Whether you're here or you're joining us online, I'd encourage you to just stretch out your arm.
place and worship you this morning, Lord, that you are for us, that you would bless us to be a blessing. And Lord, we may we be a conduit of your blessing to those around us. May we not be a vessel that stores that, but Lord, may we bless those as we walk in your presence, Lord. May your blessing be with us and through us and around us today. 
And Lord, as we worship you, as we lift the name of Jesus Christ on high, we want to pray, Lord, that your presence is in this place. We thank you that you are with us. And Lord, that through you and you only, may we know what it means to have eternal life. We praise you, Jesus, in the precious name, the name above all names, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Welcome to worship. Let's give the band a hand. That's a fantastic time of worship this morning, guys. Thank you. Why don't you turn and say a COVID safe hello to someone next to you through your mask, give them a wave, say good day. Great to have you with us today at church. Church Online, welcome to those watching us online this morning. It's always great to be able to join us. One of the great things, I've really appreciated being able to come back to church and actually seeing people's faces again. How good is it just to spend a little bit of time together in person? I mean, last year was great. We got to improvise and do church online, but uh, it's been great to actually meet in person. So welcome. If you're new to church, uh, we have a Next Steps lounge straight across the foyer. As you go out, we would love to get to know you and hear a little bit about your story and share a little bit of who we are. Uh, Today at 12.45, we actually have a welcome to church party. For anyone who's only been coming to Crossway for a short time, then we would love to uh, yeah, just share a little bit of our vision, our direction, and help you connect into community here at Crossway. So if that's you, come along, go to the Next Steps Lounge straight after this service, and uh, we can connect you in to come to the Next Steps party at, uh, at 12.45 today. Our production team do an amazing job. They're the people in black that you don't see, and if you do see, there's something wrong, but it's great the way they're able just to make everything work. We're looking for some production artists who can come alongside our team and be a part of that. We're needing some people just to help with the the stage managing, with uh, the sound and different things. If you're skilled in that area, or even if you're not, they will train you. So if this is something that God's put on your heart to serve in this area, the team would love to uh, expand and grow and just to be able to give others an opportunity to serve in this area. So if that's you, come and see TK down the front here afterwards. He would love to chat with you about that. Easter is coming, everyone. How exciting. It's only two weeks away. And uh, Pastor Scott's preaching today uh, in our Abide In Me series, week two. Heather did an amazing job last week of opening that series. And as we lead into Easter, uh, we're looking at Jesus' pathway to the cross. Our Easter presentation will be uh, this Easter, Easter Thursday, 1st of April. So it'll be 7.30, April 1st, uh, 9 and 11 o'clock, Good Friday, and then 5 p.m. on the Saturday. And Easter Sunday, we have a baptism service. So... If being baptised is something you're being challenged about or friends of yours are being challenged about, that's your opportunity right there. If you've got friends you've journeyed with through 2020, who you've been reading the Bible with, who you've been your person of peace, invite them to come along to the Easter presentation. It's a wonderful outreach opportunity. They'll hear the gospel. Uh, So yeah, great opportunity. It's free, um, but you will need to book online. We will have it online too for our online uh, congregation. So we'll be able to view it online. But for those who would able and want to come to the service, then you'll be able to book those in the coming week as well. We also have our uh, annual members meeting coming up on Wednesday the 24th of March at uh, 7.30. So if you're a member, you should have already received an email with the information about registering and also the uh, agenda for that night. If you didn't receive that email, check your junk box uh, or come to the welcome desk and give your details and they'll make sure that you get that. If you're not a member and you really want to know the background of how Crossway works, you are more than welcome to come along to that meeting. You won't be able to vote, but you can come and sit in and listen. So great opportunity just to come and be a part of that as well. Our young adults are actually away this weekend on a retreat, uh, so it's been a wonderful opportunity for them. They were meant to go away three or four weeks ago, and the Friday night they were about to head off was when we went into a five-day snap lockdown. Uh, so it's been really fortunate they were able to reschedule that retreat. So they're away this weekend, uh, but it's been a wonderful time away. Nick Glenn, our young adults pastor, has been commissioned on that retreat. Uh, so he's done a fantastic job with our young adults. So be praying for them. Uh, they're certainly an area of our church that we really see God's hand at moving at this time too. As part of the message today, Pastor Scott's going to be sharing uh, in communion. So you should have received a little cup uh, as you came in. If you didn't, just give our ushers a wave and they will bring you a cup uh, just so that you can celebrate that. So a few down the front here, guys, if you've got, can bring down some uh, some cups, that would be great. Uh, just for, if you're online, uh, feel free to grab some elements now so that you can be sharing because Pastor Scott will incorporate that in his message. So we will do that as we go. But always wonderful opportunity there. We're going to take a moment now to uh, bring our, our offerings to God. 
And so many of us give online during the week. And so uh, if you want to give in person, you can take that to the welcome desk. As of next week, you will notice on the way out, we have some lock boxes on the back wall. They're not in operation yet. They will be used as of next week. So as of next week, you can just drop your envelopes in those little lock boxes. Uh, but this week, if you can drop them at the welcome desk as well. Let's take a moment now just to pray over the offerings. Jesus, we thank you that in all that we do, everything we have belongs to you. And Lord, you invite us to worship you by giving back to you some of what you provided for us. Lord, we forget the blessing that we have living in the West. And yet we look at so much of the world that has so little. And we are so blessed simply by being born in the country we're born in, the freedom that we have and and take for granted too often. Lord, we want to present to you uh, a portion of our, our income, Lord, to give back to you for your service. So Lord, we want to pray that as we give, may you use this uh, resource for your kingdom to grow. May you use this resource as a blessing to bless others. And Lord, we want to pray that this might be a way that you really utilize what we give, Lord. Multiply that five, ten, a hundred times for the kingdom's glory, Lord. We pray a blessing over this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's always good to honour people who have uh, spoken into your life. And as we were singing that song, one of the lines was about the promise keeper. And back in the 90s, you might recall, there was a men's movement called the promise keepers movement. That's great to see Barry Cutchie here. Barry was a a lead candidate in uh, pushing that movement in Australia. I I still meet men today. That was a movement that went for probably 10 or 15 years that encouraged men to get their heart back for God. And uh, while it's not, it was predominantly about men leading the way in that space. It was a wonderful way of actually men stepping into that space. So we just want to honour Barry today for the input that he's had, not just in my life, but men's lives across Australia. Let's give Barry a round of applause. Great to have you with us worshipping too, Barry. We're going to watch a video now of our CEO of Life Care and uh, Pastor Scott having an interview just about the work that Life Care does. Life Care have done an amazing job. Uh, they're our, our ministry arm that helps those who are in tough places flourish. And so uh, we got an interview just sharing a little bit of what they've done and what they're doing and opportunities for us as a church to continue to partner with them. So I invite you to turn your attention to the screens. Hey Crossway, great to share with you as we celebrate our Life Care Focus Weekend. As we uh, uh, zoom in and remind ourselves of the, the vital importance of our partnership together in this great ministry that is Life Care. Great to be chatting with uh, our CEO of Life Care, Fiona Hall. Fiona, what a big year 2020 was. So unexpected, but incredible opportunities for Life Care. Yeah, it was amazing. It was just so fantastic to see um, both the partnerships internally within Crossway staff. Um, in Crossway Congregation and externally with so many different partnerships that we were able to uh, work together with last year in order to help so many people flourish. It was great. How'd you come through with the team? Like there were so many demands. You know? Yeah, the team were fantastic. And as I say, it was all those partnerships coming together that really meant that we could do what we could do. So we were able to hand out over 2,000 food parcels last year, which was brilliant because most of those were delivered. Um, they weren't people coming to the pantry. They were delivered. We were still able to do as much counselling as we ever did before and we managed to keep all of our services going throughout the whole year. So the team did a fantastic job. Uh, one, one photo stood out for me, it was the photo of like the Forest Hill uh, Police and some of your team because I, I was mindful when you first came into the role, uh, the vision that you brought, but to really push us out more in the local community. Uh, that's the heartbeat of Life Care. It definitely is and we're still involved with the police even now this year that partnership's going on so we're going to be doing some more stuff with the police for Easter this year which is it's just great for um, the community to know that we exist and we're there to help and we're there to see vulnerable people flourish. So, some people watching today know, know Life Care uh, very well, some maybe just getting their head around what Life Care does, the core services that Life Care provides. Yeah so obviously we've touched on the pantry um, which is part of our financial care So we do financial coaching, which is mentoring for people who need to understand how to look after their finances. Uh, We also do mentoring through the coach program for adults and for youth and for kids. And the kids program is in schools. Then we have our women's centre, which is looking after uh, women who are survivors of domestic violence. And we also have the counselling service, which is doing a fantastic job um, looking after any sort of need that you would need counselling for. And then we have our community engagement. And with the community engagement, we're running missional communities. We're also taking a shower van out to look after homeless people. 
and um, just making sure people aren't isolated. We talk about helping people in tough places to flourish. Uh, and we talk about, I guess, emotional, physical, spiritual kind of support. Uh, exciting stories as people kind of draw towards Jesus. But your team do that in such a, uh, an ethical, professional, yet a missional way. Yeah, they do. So we're very um, aware of ethical boundaries and we just make sure that we have responsible sharing of faith. But what has been really exciting to see has been the missional communities that we've started, where people are beginning to read the Bible with other people, to pray, to learn about Jesus, and do that in a way that is not forced. And we always say that we're faith-based, not faith-biased with all of our services. Um, but it's been wonderful to see so many people just taking up that offer of, I want to know more. 2021 opening up, we're celebrating uh, Life Care this weekend across all our services, across our campuses. What are you looking forward to uh, in the year ahead? Yeah, we're really looking forward to um, expanding out. We're hoping to um, take somebody on in the South East campus this year. And so we're really looking forward to seeing what we can do down at Berwick and in the South East and to take our services down there. Of course, we're looking still at Burwood East of continuing everything that we're doing. And we really just want to make sure that we um, go deeper with the people that we're helping. So we do make sure it is that socially, emotionally, and also spiritually that we're doing all of the things to make them flourish holistically so that's going to be really great so yeah that's what we're looking that's forward fantastic. to at the, at the heart of life care um, has always been people the people we get to stand alongside but your own team and our partners uh, the broader crossway community and the, the community beyond crossway how can people kind of invest in the vision how can people come alongside you and the team and say hey we're on board with life care in 2021 yeah, we always need partners and we need partners who are going to pray. We also need monthly financial partners. That's a great way of partnering with us. But we can also um, have people volunteer and help us. We're not using as many people from Team Crossway as we used to because we're trying to get some of the more um, vulnerable people, the participants who are further along on their journey involved as well. But there's still opportunities to help through the shower van or through mentoring. And we're always looking for people to help do Doing that but we also really would love to hear if people could be an everyday hero themselves that they could do something like when we've done the Melbourne Marathon in the past that they could do something that is peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and it doesn't have to be the Melbourne Marathon it could be anything that you're good at I mean we had Toby Baxter doing his kayaking marathon I'm going to do um, a long walk in May it could be anything at all and then you just set up a fundraising page do what you're good at and see if you can raise funds for life care that's a great Great idea, just uh, individuals being able to turn to an area of passion, but turn that into financial support for yeah. for, uh, for life care. Um, we love you in the role, you've, you've made such a difference uh, as a CEO and the leadership that you've brought, your, your love for Jesus, your love for people. Uh, what, do you, what do you most love, what excites you about being the CEO of life care? I think it's seeing those um, people who come along and seeing them change and then hearing their stories. Getting emails saying, you know, this is what life care's meant to me. And also seeing those people now who are work participants giving back to life care. That's just, it's just wonderful to watch. Just seeing people grow. Thanks Fiona. Hey Crossway, it's in our DNA, helping tough people to flourish. Uh, it's an opportunity we can all be a part of. We can pray for life care. As Fiona said, we can become an everyday hero and financially invest. We can join Team Crossway. Uh, let's lean in together. Let's celebrate all that God is doing through life care. Let's uh, pray and support Fiona and her team and cheer on the great ministry of Crossway Life Care. God bless you. Great to share with you today. And can I really encourage all of us to remember that, that we are life care together that uh, it's our opportunity to step out into our community in Jesus' name, to, uh, to serve together, to help people in tough places to flourish. And, and we do that together. And so opportunities to serve on Team Crossway, to, uh, to pray, to give of our, our financial uh, gifts to support the work of life care. So even think about what might I do in 2021 uh, with my peers, my colleagues, that Everyday Hero Challenge. Uh, some of you uh, today missed out on something incredibly rare and unique. As we were practicing and doing sound checks before our first service, Pastor Bill, who's hosting today, got up here and sang some country and western music. Now, I tried to get him to do it again, 
with the house full, but he won't do it. But I've challenged him to put on a country and western concert to raise funds for life care. He's yet to take up the offer. Uh, we'll see what happens. But let's get behind the great work of life care and support what they're doing. Let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful that we can be together physically and also for those joining us online. And we open up your word and we do that with a sense of confidence because you remind us that you are a God who wants to speak to us. You are a God who is speaking to us now by your spirit. And so we pray that you might give us the, the courage and the faith and the desire to cooperate with the work of your spirit today. In what is it that you might want to be saying to us as your people here at Crossway today? So we say thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. During uh, lockdown uh, here in Melbourne, I, I imagine lots of us in our families and our friendship circles, we developed some kind of new traditions and rituals as part of the way we survived last year. My, uh, my beautiful eight-year-olds uh, started providing uh, massages every day, you know, back massages. She, got, she made little vouchers. You know, Monday, Dad's back massage, Tuesday, Mum's, you know, Wednesday's Imogen's. And uh, she loved just doing that day in and day out. And uh, I, I kind of got to a point where I had about four or five vouchers I hadn't used. And I said to Ada, Ada, I've had a really big day, I'm tired. Can I trade my four back massage vouchers in for one foot massage? And she looked at me and said, Dad, you know in our family no one touches your feet. They are so ugly. <laughs> I'm still in therapy. She wouldn't go anywhere near my feet. When I was born, I was born with so many bones in my feet. And so I've got, I've got pretty ugly feet, just putting it out there today. You know, when I was a kid in uh, prep, year one, year two, it was advantageous. I could walk across a balance beam. All the other kids would fall off, but I wouldn't because my foot could go across the whole balance beam. My uh, high school friends used to say, oh, Scott's feet arrive five minutes before he does. They were really kind. When I was uh, in youth, I remember a time we were playing Red Rover crossover on a youth camp and I kind of uh, fell over a little bit of uh, an exposed kind of branch and I fell, I hit the ground, I was really in a lot of pain, I took my shoes off and the leaders raced over, looked at my feet and said, quick, call an ambulance. And I said, they always look like that. <laughs> and there I was uh, back in 2019 uh, when we could travel overseas and I was in New York, one of my favourite cities in the world, and I'd kind of done 13 hours on foot. I wanted to maximise every minute I had in that city that day. And I've always been too embarrassed to walk into a kind of foot massage spa place, you know, because I think my feet are terrible. But my feet were so sore. And here was this little place. And I walked in, I sat down. This beautiful older lady starts kind of wash up, washing and massaging my feet. Uh, and uh, I take a picture and I send it back to Megan at home and say, look at this. Do you know what my wife's reply was? I think I've still got it here. God help that poor woman. <laughs> God help that poor woman. Yeah, I've kept that one. <laughs> anyway, enough about my feet. If you weren't with us last week, Pastor Heather brought us to the theme of feet as well. But if you weren't with us last week, we started our Abide in Me series as we journey towards Easter. And can I encourage you, if you weren't a part of last week's service here or online, grab hold of the video, listen to the podcast, a fantastic message. As Pastor Heather kind of brought to life the story of Jesus being anointed by Mary and just the whole sense of what does that mean for us in our culture today. And of course, she brought us the theme of kind of feet. And we come back to this theme today as we look at one of the most, for me, one of the most powerful, provocative stories in the Gospels, Jesus washing the disciples' feet. It's a radical story. And in our culture today, we might read it and lose some of the provocative nature of this story. And I hope we can try to, to, to just glean a little, a little of that today in the time that we have. But it's also ultimately a declaration of love. It's really a love story. As Jesus washes his disciples' feet, he soon will head towards the cross. 
And we see his incredible love for us in this act and, of course, all that Easter represents. We come to John 13. And uh, I'm not going to read the whole passage today, but you might uh, today, tomorrow, this week, uh, go back to the passage in detail and ask yourself, what's God saying to me in this passage this week? Let me read a few verses as we begin today. John 13. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. Love that verse. He loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. And then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. We'll come back to some more verses a little later. Let's just uh, look at the scene today. Jesus is at the table. The Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, the Passover meal that he reframes, that we'll share in today. It's hours before his betrayal. The agony of the cross is ahead. It's a pivotal moment in Jesus' life and ministry, in fact, eternal history. Jesus is about to leave those that he dearly loves. Don't lose sight of that. He's with his friends. He's with those that he's journeyed with over his ministry years. He's with his extended family. He calls them brothers and sisters. He's about to leave them. And as he does that, He takes this Passover meal and he reframes that and will soon share in communion. But he does something profound and simple and yet scandalous in the culture that we might try to understand afresh today what does it mean to live as a citizen of the king? What does it mean for you and I to live as citizens of the king, to be people who do things the Jesus way is what we are asked to see in this story. Jesus is so often reframing contexts. Heather last week spoke about you know, the oil being poured over Jesus and the sense that most saw waste. But Jesus, of course, saw worship. He saw devotion as that story is reframed. What does it mean to live as a citizen of the king? We see Jesus go to the Samaritan woman. Jews you know, didn't hang out with Samaritans. They were ostracized, marginalized, pushed to the, the, the edges of society. But Jesus goes to this woman to, to break down that cultural taboo. But more than that, to invest in her. And she goes from being shunned to being a gospel storyteller, seeing people come to faith. Jesus reframes the context. In the Good Samaritan story, you know, we see the religious men walking by and there's the man, the ditch, who needs help. And we think that they will be the ones who stop, but they don't. It's a Samaritan, the least likely, who God uses to be godlike in the story. And Jesus constantly kind of reframing what it means to live counterculturally, what it means to be a citizen of the king. And so this morning... On my invitation that we might ask ourselves the question as we open up this simple but challenging story, where does the Holy Spirit want to bring challenge and change into our lives today? Where does the Holy Spirit want to bring his gracious invitation into our life this morning? Let me look at this first reframe in this story. and I want to suggest to you that Jesus demolishes the pecking order. In this passage, but we see that throughout the Gospels. What do we mean? Let's go back to the picture of chicken, chickens this morning. But before uh, before I moved down to uh, Melbourne, we had uh, a pretty big house with all our tribe of kids in it up north, and we had a really big back kind of area, backyard area. And uh, I was a little bit of the urban farmer, well, so I thought. Um, and uh, Bill Malcolm laughs because he grew up on a farm, and he's a real farmer. Um, but uh, we had uh, chickens and baby goats and hamsters and rabbits and ducks. One stage there was a sheep running around and it would get out and run down the main road towards Westfield. That was a sight to look at. Um, but there were the chickens and all my kids got little chicks, you know, and they're so cute. 
And they grow up, of course. And there they are in the pen. And what happens? The domination dance. Number one chook assumes the position at the head of the pecking order and he can kind of peck down the list. He can have a go at all the chickens and there's number two in the pecking order and number three and number four and you don't want to kind of be chicken number 12 at the bottom of the pecking order. And I used to watch that simple kind of exercise play out in nature and I was so often reminded that the culture in which I live fosters that thinking within me. It fosters a culture of the pecking order, that I am better than someone else because of whatever it might be. And the reality is, as God's people, we need to own that. We need to accept the reality that our culture breeds that around us. And how do we live counterculturally to that? Because Jesus demolishes the pecking order. He demolishes the thinking that because I'm I'm of a certain background or a certain culture or, or position or prestige or wealth or whatever it is, he destroys that thinking. And we see it powerfully in this passage. Because what should have happened here? Jesus is reclining at the table. As Heather reminded us, they're sitting on the ground, eating the feast of the food before them. And you know, there I am on the ground next to me, Pastor Bill. And of course, Pastor Bill has to sit close to my ugly feet. And what should have happened or what normally happened in that culture? Of course, when the people arrived for the gathering, the meal, there would have been a servant or a slave there. If not, sometimes a child or a woman in that patriarchal culture. And their feet would have been washed before they sat to eat. But it hasn't happened here. And why hasn't it happened? Why hasn't it happened? Because there seems like there was no servant or slave. But don't lose sight of this powerful part of the story. It hasn't happened because none of the disciples will lower themselves to that task. None of the disciples would lower themselves that task because they're caught up in the pecking order. We see it in the Gospels. They're arguing about who is the greatest. They're arguing about who's more kind of spiritually mature, who's going to kind of be the closest to Jesus, what's their future look like, what's going to happen to him compared to me. They're caught up in the pecking order of the culture. And the reality is that can be true for us even in the church that can play out. None of them will lower themselves to wash the feet of the other. And then, of course, what happens? The most unexpected happens. Jesus stands up. Jesus walks and takes the bowl and the towel. And Jesus comes back and lowers himself and begins to wash the feet of the disciples. And, and Peter, in a sense, initially wants no part of it. And the disciples are suddenly thinking, he shouldn't be doing that. That should be us. And their world is again turned upside down as we think about the countercultural values of Jesus and the kingdom. And the reality here that Jesus, the God of heaven, the Son of God who comes to earth, here is Jesus with the water, here is Jesus with the towel, here is Jesus washing dirty, messy feet. Because Jesus destroys the pecking order that our world seeks to continue to foster. Intentionally or unintentionally, all around us, it's a part of who we are. We're bombarded with messages around that. So, for example, this morning, you, know, you, you might be stuck and you might look at the world through a position lens. I, I want more power. I want more prestige. And it's about how you're seen in the culture. It could sadly be about race. could sadly be that, God, there are still issues in me that you need to work on because of how I see people who are not like me. And I'm mindful that there are some, even within our community, who still continue to suffer the abuse of racism and that we want to stand against that in our culture. The wealth lens, where where we get caught up with how much money we have or how much money we'd like to have or we see people as successful because of their wealth or their bank balance. 
the success lens, the, the gender lens, the, the prejudice lens, where there is something still innate within us that means we see people who are not like us differently, or the bigotry lens, whatever it is where we don't see people create an image of God and hold them with the same sense of dignity because they're not like us. Jesus destroys that thinking. And he calls us as a Christian community to move away from such thinking. And the lesson for me, the humbling, sobering lesson for me, is I have to own the fact that at times I can think that way. I have to own my poor attitude. I have to own it because then I can pray, God, by your spirit, keep changing me. Keep being at work within me that I might embrace more of what it means to follow the king. Look at this verse. Don't be selfish. Don't try and impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. I need to keep speaking that over my life every day because I live in a world, you live in a world, where every day we're told to reverse that. But the way of Jesus Think of others as better than yourselves. Are there things that we need to come to, do, to leave at the cross today to let go of pecking order thinking that we might be more like Jesus? And the second refrain that is closely aligned to that, Jesus demolishes our culture's obsess, obsession with assent. What do I mean? We live in a culture that continues to call on us all the time to rise up. That we need more wealth, we need a bigger house, the bigger payback packet, more prestige, uh, more success, uh, you know, a bigger following on social media. We live in a world that is obsessed with ascent. Now, please hear me. I'm not saying at all that we should let go of holy ambition or that we should not want to improve ourselves or get that promotion, or look after our family. I'm not saying that at all, but it all comes back to the kingdom lens. This passage and the whole of the New Testament, as we look at what does it mean to live with that kingdom lens? What does it mean to live counterculturally in a world that says to Scott Pilgrim, rise, climb, focus on yourself, seek to move up? Jesus demolishes that way of thinking. Because in this passage... As a powerful metaphor, uh, we see Jesus, the king, lower himself, humble himself, and call us, you and I, to the way of humility. I mean, think about it. God himself breaks into human history, and what does Jesus do? He gives up the rights of heaven to lower himself, to move into the human neighborhood, to become flesh for our sake. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus lowers himself. He falls to the ground and he says, Father, I don't want to die on the cross, but I surrender my will if there be no other way. He lowers himself. He humbles himself. He soon will leave the table. He'll leave this meal and he'll be lowered and nailed to a cross for you and I. And here in this passage, we see him stoop down. We see him lower himself. The disciples expected a warrior king. The disciples expected one who would come with revolution and overthrow. They weren't ready. They weren't prepared for the reframing Jesus who actually comes and washes dirty feet. But that is the servant king that we worship and follow. And what does Paul go on to say from the verse we looked at before? You must have the same attitude of Christ. You must have the same attitude of Christ Jesus. Though he was God, he did not consider equality with God something to cling to. And look at this. Instead, he chose to lower himself to become a humble servant. Now, a humble servant doesn't mean that we lay our life down as a doormat and allow others to walk over us all the time as some people sometimes kind of try and paint that picture, not at all. But what does it mean for me to every day seek to lower myself? What does it mean for me every day to seek to crucify myself, 
that I might look and live more like Jesus and embrace the values of the kingdom. What does it mean for me to turn my ears away from that call of the world to ascend and to see that the follower of Jesus descends into a life of humility, taking up our cross, following Jesus, the call to humility. You know what I've learnt? I've learnt that humility is a lifelong, daily process. You know, I would love to order humility and pick it up in five days' time. I'd love to be able to order humility online. Ever since we've had lockdown, my kids, you know, all they want to do is, Dad, we don't need to go to the shops. Order it online. Dad, my birthday's coming. Here's what I'd like. Order it online. (laughs) You can't order humility. You can't manufacture humility. The only way that Scott Pilgrim can continue on the journey of humility is to allow the Spirit of Jesus to be at work in me because I am innately a sinful, selfish person who needs God to be at work in my life. It's a daily process. My grandmother used to like to play uh, country and western albums. Some of you are young enough, you'll need to Google album, okay? Uh, my, uh, my eldest boy has rediscovered turntables, and uh, he now buys albums or likes albums the gift. Vinyl. Vinyl's a lot more expensive today than it used to be when I was a kid. I could get an album for 99 cents. He got an album recently, it cost him $80 on vinyl. Wow. Anyway, she used to play country and western music, and she used to play this song all the time. Uh, and uh, now, Bill, who was it? Mac Davies. Mac Davies, apparently, is the original. She used to play the Kenny Rogers version. This is the song that Bill was up singing this morning. Gosh, I wish we had it on video. Uh, oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. Now, you know what? I know for sure, Crossway, I am far from perfect. But, oh Lord, it's hard to be humble. Because we live in a world, a culture, innately as a sinful person, I've got to deal with pride every day of my life. C.S. Lewis, I love this. C.S. Lewis says, you don't kind of meet a humble person and you say, wow, that person's humble, just like you'd say that person has brown hair. He says, no, humble people just get on with being humble. And you walk away from that person, you say, what was it about that person? And then you say, yeah, it's the humility, the way they live their life. And here's the ouch moment for me, and it might be for you, but we need to hear this. I need to in my life. C.S. Lewis says, what is the first step to Christ-like humility? What's the first step? You know what he said the answer was? Acknowledging every day that I'm a proud person. Wow. (laughs) But it's as I acknowledge pride and say, God, forgive me. God, help me. God, change me. That I learn more about what it is to be a citizen of the King, to do life the Jesus way, not to chase ascent, but to descend, not to make life about me, but to focus on others rather than self, to focus on more of Jesus and less of me, that day by day, Holy Spirit, help me to understand what does it mean to walk the path of humility. Jesus demolishes the pecking order. And it may be today if we're brave enough and courageous enough and obedient enough that the Holy Spirit will be saying, we need to let go of some poor attitudes that we have to other people. Jesus demolishes the the call of ascent. And it may be today if we're brave enough and courageous enough and obedient enough that God's Spirit will lay upon our heart that we need to stop chasing things the world calls us to and focus more on the kingdom priorities and kingdom values. And our third reframe today, Jesus demolishes the notion of cheap servanthood. We are a serving church and we celebrate that. We love that. Thank you. So many people serving us. Just to come into the building today, you've been served by so many people. This service occurring, you've been served by so many people. We love to serve here. But let's grab hold of this truth again. It's one thing to serve. It's another thing to love. It's one thing to serve. 
It's another thing to love. I, I can serve. I can serve you without loving you. But the reality is if I serve you without loving you, I will soon become tired and jaded and cynical. I will soon find reasons why I don't want to serve you. And I will soon find reasons to criticize and whinge about my service. That's human nature. But if I understand more every day God's love for me and his love for broken people like me and I invest in serving like Jesus in the midst of messiness and it comes out of love, I will serve with sincerity and I'll make a difference in the lives of others. Because, you know, we've got to be honest enough to acknowledge that that I find some people easy to love. And I won't ask you to stand up today, okay? But I find some people hard to love. And yet Jesus wants to continue to put me into that laboratory of learning what love looks like. Because our culture says that love is cheap and it's about feeling good and it's about putting yourself first and it's about me. But the love of Jesus is the love of another kind. He loves despite the circumstances. You don't get nailed to a cross unless you love despite the circumstances. It's the love that Jesus calls us to. How do I learn to love others, including my enemies, Jesus says. How do I learn to love others that I might serve them like Jesus? What what does Christ-like service look like? We remind ourselves of this on a weekend that we celebrate the work of life care. Because we remind ourselves that Christ-like service is, is incarnational. What does that big word mean? God breaks into human history. He becomes a human. He enters the human neighborhood. He becomes flesh and blood. He engages with us. Look at Jesus. He gets the bowl. He gets the water. He doesn't get more human. He gets down skin to skin. And we see God himself washing dirty feet. It's humbling. God calls us to uncomfortable places. When we step out in love and we step out in service, God is going to put us in places that are uncomfortable. But why? Because he stretches us and grows us. You know, one of the greatest experiences I think I've seen in my own life is as I serve others in uncomfortable places, it's not about what Scott Pilgrim is doing for others. It's actually about what God is doing in my life. It's not so much about that person who may need my love and support as I come alongside them, as much as as helpful as that is. It's God making me more of the person that he wants me to be. It's incarnational, it's humbling, it's uncomfortable, and of course it's, it's costly. We move towards Easter and we see Jesus nailed to the cross. And dare I then think about the cost that I bear compared to his. I take up my cross. But what is the cost compared to Jesus giving his all for me? And what is the cost for us in affluent Western faith communities compared to those who risk their lives today across the world to simply come to worship? Or people who this week will lay down their life for their faith. I'm challenged again by the call of Jesus that I might pick up my cross. And I'm struck again, and I need to remind myself of this often, that the Gospels don't tell me to pick up my cross and then say, look at the cost I'm carrying. But I'm encouraged to pick up my cross and seek to follow Jesus faithfully and obediently and humbly. It's one thing to serve. It's another thing to serve the Jesus way. Because countercultural service always flows from countercultural love. We can only serve like Jesus when we learn to love like Jesus. And what a powerful reminder from foot washing to the cross as we share in communion today to remind ourselves the cost that Jesus would go. to bring his love into our lives, but more than that, more than that, that he esteems you and I, he esteems you and I so much that he would send us out to be his hands and feet in a broken world. 
And so we come to the table today and we remind ourselves of Jesus' sacrifice. We remind ourselves of that love of another kind. We remind ourselves of what Jesus would do for you and for me, but then how he would send us out into a beautiful but broken world to be his hands and feet. Look at this as we move to wrap up today and we share in communion together. Come back to the the table and there are the disciples sitting on the ground and they're they're still trying to fathom the fact that Jesus has gone and he's picked up the bowl and the water and the towel. He's come and he's washing their feet and he washes Peter's feet and they're messy and they're dusty from the roads and he washes Peter's feet. And, and, and as a metaphor, there's a picture here of messiness and brokenness because Peter hasn't got it all together. And you know, I can imagine as Jesus washes Peter's feet, he looks up at Peter and he can see possibility and potential. He sees Peter as he is, but as he could become. He sees the one who will actually deny knowing him. And yet he'll teach Peter that valuable lesson. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? And he'll turn Peter's life around. And we here today, 2,000 years on, are part of a movement that that broken disciple will birth with others across the globe. And he watches John's feet. And he sees brokenness, but he sees potential. And he watches Thomas's feet. And Thomas will ask lots of questions about the resurrection, but he sees possibility and potential. And then he watches my feet. He washes my feet. And he sees my sin and my brokenness and my inadequacies and my fears and my failures and my messiness. But he sees more than that. He continues to see my potential and my hopes and my dreams and and the difference that love and grace and forgiveness And he tears wash my feet. Because he sees me as I am, but he sees me as I can still become. Why? Because Christ's love intersects my story. Christ's love intersects your story. And maybe we need to claim that afresh today. Can I grab the table? If you need to reclaim the the truth today that God comes to you in your brokenness, He sees you as you are and as you can become. Can I invite you to take the elements today, just to open them? We take the the bread, the wafer, the biscuit. We take the bread and we remind ourselves that Jesus would lower himself. He would humble himself. He would choose the path of descent rather than ascent because he loves us so much and he surrenders to the will of the Father. He lays down his life for us. Let's eat with thankful hearts today. We take the bread, we eat it, and we remind ourselves of what God has done for us. The wonder of that. But you know, we could leave it there. But of course, there's more. Because God doesn't want to make it about us. He wants to make it about others. And so the invitation of fresh today, the challenge of fresh today, 
that we might embrace the humble, loving, serving way of Jesus afresh. Or we might allow God to bring attitude change to our lives. We might allow God to change us so we step out into a broken but beautiful world this week to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to take up our cross and follow him. And with that invitation and challenge, let's drink together to the one who would lay down his life for you and for me. Because how does Jesus finish this episode? What's Jesus challenged the disciples 2,000 years ago? He's challenged to us today. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Jesus is not just talking about foot washing there. Jesus is saying the way of the king is the narrow road. The way of the king is servanthood. The way of the king is humility. The way of the king is love. And he invites us today by his spirit that we might let go of pecking order thinking, that we might let go of chasing ascent, that we might let go of notions of cheap servanthood, that we might courageously embrace afresh the way of Jesus. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you that you're a good, good Father. Thank you that you love us so much that you don't come after us to kind of beat us with a stick, but you beckon us with grace. You beckon us with love. You beckon us with forgiveness. You beckon us into a deeper relationship because you love us and you want to continue to work in us that we can understand more of what it is to live life the way you intended, that we could embrace more the way of life as citizens of the King. So King Jesus, servant King, by your Spirit move amongst us today. Servant King, With grace and forgiveness, help us to lay down negative attitudes, poor attitudes, how we see other people. Help us to lay down pride. Help us to lay down the pecking order. Help us to lay down chasing after things that aren't of the King. Help us to surrender ourselves afresh to you that you might do a good new work within us. And so right now, as we come to sing and close our service together, it's been my, it's my real sense the Holy Spirit's been at work in our lives today. Challenging message and yet one that will allow us to step out with freedom afresh that we might live and look like Jesus. So, so can I invite you, if the Holy Spirit has spoken into your world today and you know that today there's a need for change. There's a need for change in your thinking and your living and that you want to look and live more like Jesus. Can I invite you to stand right now? Just stand right where you are. The Holy Spirit's spoken today. God bless you. God bless you. Stand right now. Make that declaration today across the auditorium. You can do that online today. God, I want you to bring change into my life. Forgive me. Help me to live a life that looks more like Jesus. Humble me. God bless you. Courageous people standing across the room saying, Come Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. To each person standing, Father, by your Spirit, give them courage and grace and peace and resolve today. In Jesus' name. Let's stand and worship, Crossway. May His favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children.
Lord Jesus, may that be our prayer this week. May we go, may you go before us. And Lord, may we see where you are calling us to humbly serve, to show your love and to serve those around us. So Lord, we thank you for the challenge that Scott's laid before us that we may step out to show love of who you are through how we serve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Great to be here today. If you were really, if God's moved you, if you're one of the people who stood when Scott shared, our prayer team are available down the front. We also normally take up a welfare offering uh, after the communion. So if you'd like to donate to that, please go to the welcome desk. If you're new, newcomers across the lounge, please take your little cups with you as you go as well and put them in the bin. And uh, in, in accepting Scott's challenge of, uh, of serving, I did think about singing, but I did ask Pastor uh, Sam, and I said to him, you know, what do you think about me joining the worship team? And he said, your likelihood of you joining the worship team is up there with Pastor Scott being a foot model. So uh, we'll stay in our streaks. God bless. Have a great week. Great to be with you today.